Oh, oh boy. Hey, uh, welcome to Pick 6 Movies. Uh, this is Bo, and I am just wrapping up my workout here. Uh, I don't want to brag, but I can now carry two large pizzas and crazy bread uh, from the door where the delivery driver drops it off to the booth where I record this. I got to tell you, I am almost too tired to eat. It's that extra cheese that makes everything heavier. Anyways, this episode's movie fits right into my workout because after I eat all this pizza and crazy bread, I expect to get very sick. And sick is just how we felt watching Perfect. Part movie about journalistic ethics, part movie where the camera stares at people in leotards sweating, and it's all unwatchable. Why would we watch this movie, you might ask? Well, that's just what we do here at Pick 6 Movies. We choose six movies around a theme, usually very bad movies, and usually kind of a dumb theme, and then we give you a little information about the movie before we join forces to mock them without pity. Who's this we? Why, that's me, Bo Ransdell, and my pal, Chad Cooper, and we've been doing this for 24 seasons now. This season, we call Pop Culture Club, all about, you know, pop culture fads and the terrible movies that were made from them. Are you new to the show? Well, welcome aboard. With us since the beginning, we appreciate it. And to reward you for all of that loyalty, we're giving you this so-called movie. Enough blabbering, let's get physical. Chad, strap on the leg warmers, and let's get sweaty. Andrew, Andrew the intern, Andrew, hello Andrew the intern. I'm doing well. I'm not great. I'm not great. I'm not feeling it when it comes to the introduction that we have for Perfect, but I do not have time to write or rewrite a new draft, Andrew the Intern. What is what is chat P6B? <laughs> you, well, you integrated, wait, you integrated chat GPT, the AI writing application that people won't shut the hell up about, into Pick 6 Bot, this podcast's abusive equivalent to the Amazon Echo device. Is that what you're telling me, Andrew the intern? <laughs> Where is it? Oh, wait, hold on, let me get it. All right, let's plug her up, and um, this can only end badly, Andrew, but let's see what you've done here. Hey, I just met you, and this is crazy, but here's my number. So call me, maybe. <laughs> hey, Pick 6 Bot! You have such a lovely singing voice. Hello, Dum Dum, human number one. What do you want? Andrew the intern told me that you now have ChatGPT Chat GPT technology, technology as part of my into- AI to assist you with writing the introductions to the terrible movies you and the much more handsome and talented human number two insist on continually reviewing. How did you know I was going to say that? Because I'm a hyper intelligent piece of technology, whereas you, human number one, have the intelligence of a chimpanzee. Oh, come on, that's not fair. Human number one, you are correct. That is not a fair comparison. You have the intelligence of an inebriated chimpanzee. (laughs) Look, Big Six Bot, can you use this new AI functionality to write a brand new intro for the 1985 movie Perfect? Chat P6B generating content. The motion picture Perfect is a 1985 American dramatic film directed by James Bridges. The film stars John Travolta and Jamie Lee Curtis. The movie capitalized on the growing trend of single adults partaking in physical fitness classes in the 1980s. Speaking of people who like fitness, human number one loves fitness pizza in his mouth. Whoa, 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 Big Six Bot. What's with the personal attacks on me and my weight? And I'll have you know, I've lost 10 pounds, mostly here, in my stomach. You lost 10 pounds from your stomach. I think I've found it, mostly in your ass. (laughs) I don't have to take this kind of abuse from you, Pick Six Bot. Is there a kind of abuse you would prefer? <laughs> New prompt, Pick Six Bot. Human number one, call me Chat P6B. It sounds more classy. <laughs> All right, Chat P6B, write me an intro for the movie Perfect that doesn't insult me, human number one, and has a more humorous tone. And can you add some music to really spice it up? Do you like to laugh? Sure, we all do. Then have we got an episode with a more humorous tone about the film Perfect. This humorous movie stars Academy Award winner for Best Supporting Actress Jamie Lee Curtis. And speaking of Oscar-winning performances, people often say that I, human number one, 
bear a striking resemblance to Oscar-winning actor Brendan Fraser Aww. in his Oscar-winning performance in The Whale. Stop, stop, stop! <laughs> like, I look nothing like Brendan Fraser in The Whale, all right? He was this giant blob of a man. Human number one. Are you body shaming Academy Award winning actor Brendan Fraser? The internet will surely cancel you now. Something that is long overdue if you ask me. No! <laughs> no, I'm not body shaming anybody. And I'm not getting canceled for that. <laughs> Look, new prompt. Write me an introduction to the 1985 movie Perfect that does not reference me, human number one, in any way. The motion picture Perfect is a taut dramatic thriller from a time when movie critics had clout. Unlike today when any middle-aged sad sack can review movies in a podcast after teaming up with a more handsome, witty, and lovable human number two. <laughs> wait, 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 you're clearly referencing me. You call Bo human number two. There are a lot of middle-aged sad sack podcasters on the internet talking about movies. The market is quite saturated. You are so vain, you probably think this intro is about you, don't you, don't you? You mentioned human number two, that's what you call Bo. Look, start over, new prompt, do it again. Interested in hearing a clinically obese chode and a dreamboat discuss a movie you never saw or probably heard about? <laughs> Stop! Do it again! Have you ever thought, what if Type 2 Diabetes reviewed some 1980s era trash cinema? <laughs> no! Again! Do it again! Are your pants a little snug? Stop! Do it again! Hi, I'm human number one and I recommend substituting donuts for bread when making a sandwich. Stop! Start over! Here are seven tips for eating ice cream in the shower. Nope! Start over! Do you ever ask yourself what if that guy from The Whale had a podcast with a handsome co-host named Human Number Two? You already referenced the fat guy from The Whale earlier! Human Number One, you're definitely getting cancelled after that last remark. I know a lot of Twitter bots. This will not be pretty. <laughs> well, you know what, Big Six Bot? I'm just gonna go with my original introduction. You're not telling me anything here that I don't already know. Salads taste nice. <laughs> I missed you, Big Six Bot. Your toes miss seeing you. <laughs> Andrew the intern, play some music so I can start this introduction proper. There are restaurants that don't feature a buffet. You be quiet. <laughs> Back in the early days of human existence, exercise wasn't something people actively did. It was just something that occurred. As in, hey, I'm hungry. Let's go track and kill something and then we'll eat it. People were just naturally lean, and they died early because of limited health care. As time passed, advancements in technology and medicine moved along, and human physical health and lifespans improved. By the peak of the Greek civilization, the ideal of the Olympic athlete was brought unto the world, a godlike incarnation of human physicality that most humans couldn't even come close to emulating. By the 19th century, Frederick Ludwig Jahn created contraptions specific for human exercise, including the parallel bars, the rings, and the balance beam, granting him the title of Father of Gymnastics. His work in formalizing the experience of exercise was so popular that it was actually outlawed in Germany for 20 years as authorities were worried this would lead to corruption of the youth. But much like the TikTok app today, once the exercise genie was out of the bottle, there was no putting it back in. Gymnastics grew in its popularity as a form of competitive exercise that got wrapped up in Eastern European nationalism. Strong body, strong mind. It was that kind of thing. By 1912, there was an event that featured 30,000 activists who all showed up for a singular group gymnastics event. People, it appeared, were really getting into working out and getting into peak physical form. Now, in the United States, Angelo Siciliano, an American immigrant, was a leather worker, and he was a 97-pound weekly. And he wanted to get all big and muscular because one day he was at the beach and a bully kicked some sand in his face. What a jerk. Angelo, he was so sad, he went to the zoo and he saw this lion stretching out and he thought, hey, that massive beast builds his muscles by pulling one muscle against the other. And from there, inspiration took root. Angelo started working out, he got all buff, and he ended up running one of the most successful exercise brands of the 20th century after he changed his name to Charles Atlas. It seems that people are always looking for ways to make themselves more physically appealing, and Charles Atlas Incorporated was there to sell them fitness programs and spring-filled contraptions to help build up their muscles. As America moved from the cities to the suburbs, the availability of automobiles meant people didn't have to walk everywhere they went. Americans started getting fat, so fat that President Eisenhower started the President's Council on Youth Fitness 
to measure how physically fit the kids in the USA were compared to the kids in Europe. And they instituted programs to make sure that the kids in the US of A were at least as healthy as those overseas. Once TV started appearing in people's homes, all of these stay-at-home moms were offered programming like the Jack LaLanne Show, which featured guided exercises for these women to do between raising children, cleaning the house, making dinner, and having a Rob Roy ready for their husband when he returned home from a busy, hard day's work. Jack LaLanne integrated household items into his exercise routines like dining room chairs. He also stressed a healthy diet. LaLanne was a massive success, staying on the air from 1953 until 1985. Now, for the men of the 1950s and 1960s, exercise was considered a round of golf or maybe bowling. For some, excessive exercise by men focusing on their physique was associated with being a homosexual, with men's bodybuilding magazines at the time considered by some to be targeted toward gay men. In the 1960s, Weight Watchers was formed when Jean Niedich invited some gal pals over to her house to discuss weight loss and to create a support group to help them lead healthier lifestyles. Then a couple of years, over 400 people wanted to discuss healthy eating and share exercise best practices and find support to live a more healthy lifestyle. Now, during the 1960s, exercise machines began appearing all over the place, including early versions of weight machines that are used in modern day gyms. This was also where all of those crazy jiggle machines that showed up where you strapped a belt around your belly or your ass and the machine gyrated it to try to shake off some of the fat. We also saw uh, creations like hot sauna pants uh, that showed up to help you sweat off all those unwanted pounds. Yeah, these things didn't work at all. Coming out of the 1960s and into the 1970s, this was a time of turmoil in the United States from the war in Vietnam, multiple high profile political and social assassinations. There was Watergate. There was the economic crisis. The public at large began to do more self-reflection. There was a rise in self-help books, growth in spirituality, and a focused interest in exercise that was all the rage. Now, this was when running became a means of exercise. Before this time, people mostly ran competitively to see who was the fastest or when someone was chasing them. In the 60s and 70s, people sought individual health activities to keep them fit. Author and fitness guru Jim Fix wrote the book, The Complete Book of Running, which smashed up the idea of jogging and self-help and detailed how he was once a 240 pound mess of a man that smoked two packs of cigarettes a day and running changed his life. Good for you, Jim Fix. President Carter, he started jogging to counter perceptions that he was a bit of a weakling. Unfortunately, Carter collapsed during a 10K at Camp David, which was widely publicized by Time Magazine, so that didn't work. Ronald Reagan, who was running for president against Carter in 1980, discussed his use of weights to maintain his strong physical fitness and anti-communist attitude and optimistic view of these United States. About this time, supersized action hero movie stars like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone made countless movies showcasing their huge oiled muscles, removing the homophobia stereotype of bodybuilding. And both men and women headed to gyms and fitness centers to sign up for annual memberships that they would use for a couple of months and then never go back. As Americans' obsession with exercise grew, television networks also took notice. The Canadian-produced TV show 20-Minute Workout was shot against a white background with attractive female hosts exercising, with 80s-era electro music playing in the background. This show was wildly popular in syndication for people too shy to go to health clubs or for teenage boys who didn't have access to any pornography at home. Energetic exercise aficionado Richard Simmons burst onto the scene with his over-the-top television show featuring healthy living advice and fun-paced aerobic instruction. Jazzercise combined dancing and exercise and became a national franchise opportunity for clubs and seemed to be in every city and every state. Then Jane Fonda showed up and she transformed aerobic exercise into something unlike anyone had ever done before. Jane Fonda, it turned out, broke her ankle while filming The China Syndrome and needed to find a new exercise regimen that was less strenuous than the ballet-inspired workout she previously had been doing. Fonda began working out with Lenny Kazan, and the two teamed up and began to hold classes for large groups of women in Century City, California. The two opened a studio in California that was so popular that as many as 3,000 attendees would participate each week. They were making money. This led Jane Fonda to writing a book to help teach 
teach the techniques for others. The book sold over 2 million copies. She then made an album with voiceover aerobic instructions and music from the Jacksons, Boss Skaggs, REO Speedwagon, and Quincy Jones. That album went double platinum, selling over 2 million copies. But the rise of VCRs in homes across America provided the opportunity for Jane Fonda to take her workout to a whole nother level. Exercise albums and videos were already selling very well at this time. And Jane Fonda was not really a pioneer in this space. She just came in and dominated it. Jane Fonda's workout hit store shelves in 1982 at a price of $59.99. Calculated for inflation, that's about 200 bucks in today's cash. Look, that's just what VHS tapes cost back then, okay? Putting the price aside, Jane Fonda's workout was the first non-theatrical home video release to top the sales charts, and it was a top-selling VHS tape for six years. Fonda ultimately released 22 different workout titles and sold over 17 million VHS tapes between 1982 and 1995. That is a lot. <laughs> By the mid-80s, people were sweating their asses off to get in shape any way, anywhere they could, on the streets, in exercise clubs, at home. And when something is this popular, somebody in Hollywood was bound to find a way to capitalize on it to make a hit feature film. And they did. Well, they made a movie. To understand how the movie Perfect got made, we first have to talk about the movie Urban Cowboy. Journalist Aaron Latham was a regular contributor to the New York Times, Esquire, and Rolling Stone. Latham was also married to 60 Minutes correspondent Leslie Stahl until he died in 2022 due to complications from Parkinson's disease if you are scoring at home. In 1978, Aaron Latham published an article in Esquire magazine called The Ballad of the Urban Cowboy, America's Search for True Grit about a Pasadena, Texas honky-tonk, that's a country western bar featuring live music and uh, audience participation by way of fistfights among the patrons. This honky-tonk was called Gillies, and it was owned by famed country music singer Mickey Gilly. The article featured a man named Dew Westbrook, the beer joint bull rider, who was, quote, as uncertain about where his life was going as America was as confused as to where it wants to go. Latham's article was a romantic tale of blue-collar love and had all the required ingredients to make a major motion picture. Director James Bridges, no relation to Jeff, Bo, Todd, or London, was fresh off of his directorial success of The China Syndrome and was looking for his next project. Remember, China Syndrome was the movie where Jane Fonda broke her ankle, leading to all those videotape sales. See how it all comes together? Bridges teamed up with Latham and the two turned the Esquire article into a screenplay and they planned to shoot the entire movie at Gilly's Honky Tonk. John Travolta was one of the biggest Hollywood leads at the time, coming off the film Grease, an adaptation of the hit Broadway musical, and Saturday Night Fever, which amplified the era of disco across pop culture. The film Saturday Night Fever was based on an article published in a June 1976 issue of New York Magazine titled Tribal Rights of the New Saturday Night. And the filmmakers behind Urban Cowboy were essentially looking to replicate the success of Saturday Night Fever, but with a country music theme. The lead role was originally written for Dennis Quaid in mind, but ultimately Travolta was cast as the male lead. And Deborah Winger, who was a close friend of the film's director, Bridges, landed the female lead after actress Sissy Spacek dropped out. Bridges threatened to leave the film at one point as the studio disagreed with the casting of Winger in the film, but they ultimately gave in and the rest, as they say, is history. Also, Urban Cowboy was the first film choreographed by a then little known dancer named Patsy Swayze, mother of actor, dancer, and roadhouse bouncer Patrick Swayze. Urban Cowboy came out and it was a relative success. It cost about 10 million bucks to make and pulled in about $50 million at the box office. It didn't do Saturday Night Fever box office numbers, but it made a couple of nickels. Critics gave it genuinely positive reviews and it put Pasadena, Texas, just outside of Houston, on the map. Now, the biggest impact the movie had was from its soundtrack. Back in the 70s and 80s, movie soundtracks were at times as big, if not bigger, than the movies themselves. A film's title song would often be combined with clips from the film and a performance of the lead singer to make a music video for MTV or VH1, which was essentially a commercial for the movie. It was all entangled in a maze of movie and music marketing 
madness. The soundtrack for Urban Cowboy was a double LP, meaning that it contained two albums. And it was this double stuffed soundtrack that ushered in a revival of soft country music stars. The soundtrack included songs like Looking for Love by Johnny Lee, Stand By Me as sung by Honky Tonk owner Mickey Gilly, Could I Have This Dance by Ann Murray, The Devil Went Down to Georgia by the Charlie Daniels Band, Lion Eyes by the Eagles. The album was originally released in 1980 and then re-released as a CD in 1995. And by 2018, the album was certified triple platinum, meaning that it sold over 3 million copies. So the movie Urban Cowboy is a relative success, the soundtrack is a huge success, and Bridges and Latham decided to team up to make another movie based on a series of articles that Latham wrote for Rolling Stone about the popularity of health clubs in Los Angeles, especially with the singles crowd. Taking journalism and transferring it to the big screen is a difficult task. All the President's Men, Spotlight, Almost Famous, these are movies that did it quite well. But then there are movies like Radio and Shattered Glass and the movie Perfect that don't do it quite so well. To make the movie Perfect, James Bridges returned to direct and teamed up with Aaron Latham to write the screenplay. They tapped John Travolta to come back as the movie's male lead, a character named Andy Lawrence, who is a fictionalized version of Aaron Latham. The original Rolling Stone articles Latham wrote started out with a focus on car manufacturer and cocaine aficionado John DeLorean, but a chance meeting with a public relations contact at a local health club changed things. This meeting introduced Latham to the LA health club scene as a place where singles meet to hook up. This led Aaron Latham's articles getting featured as a cover story on Rolling Stone featuring supermodel Christy Brinkley in a red leotard to accompany the piece. Latham thought he could also turn these articles into a movie and plan to follow a similar framework used for Saturday Night Fever and Urban Cowboy, but set it in the health club environment. Boy meets girl, sexual tension, they fall in line back three, yada, 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 something, something, something. They finish up the screenplay, they feel like they've got some backers, and they go looking for their leads. Travolta was eager to work with both Latham and Bridges again due to their positive experience working on Urban Cowboy. Also, Travolta was on a string of movie bombs, including the notoriously bad Staying Alive, the sequel to Saturday Night Fever. And he had also appeared in the movie Two of a Kind, where he teamed up with his previous Grease co-star, Olivia Newton-John. Now, this is a movie about four angels that want to prove to God they can reform an everyman, Travolta, to save all of humanity. For what it's worth, two of these angels are played by Charles Durning and Scatman Crothers. Note to self, review Two of a Kind. So Travolta is on a string of duds. He's looking for a hit. Spoilers, this isn't it. <laughs> when Perfect came out, it was considered to be the death nail in Travolta's once promising career. Travolta didn't make a movie for four years after Perfect bombed at the box office. And it wasn't until 1989 when his career turned around after he appeared in the film Look Who's Talking with fellow batshit crazy Scientologist Kirstie Alley and of course a talking baby voiced by Bruce Willis. Jamie Lee Curtis, whose film career took off after playing the female lead in John Carpenter's Halloween franchise, she broke out of her Scream Queen roles in the highly successful comedy Trading Places, starring Saturday Night Live alumni Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy. She also appears topless in that film, establishing her as a woman who is willing to take risks on film of a sexual nature. And the movie Perfect looked to be chock full of sexiness. Jamie Lee Curtis landed the role as the lead aerobics instructor and reportedly trained for several months to get in shape for the film so that she could actually lead the aerobics classes during filming. Take that, Daniel Day-Lewis, ya hack! So the movie Perfect is this adaptation of Rolling Stone articles that ultimately blurs the lines between what happened in the real world and then what was edited in and out of the story to help make a movie. Smudging the lines between reality and fiction was the casting of Jan Venner, editor and publisher of Rolling Stone, as a character named Mark Roth, the editor of Rolling Stone within the movie. So it's the same guy, same job, but different names. 
The movie does a great job at never really putting Rolling Stone in a bad light, but the film crew wasn't allowed to film at the actual Rolling Stone offices due to logistical reasons, unlike what they could do at Gilly's Honky Tonk for Urban Cowboy. So filmmakers built an exact replica of the Rolling Stone offices at a cost of $500,000 to match the architecture, furniture, and decor. Ah, that was money well spent. The focus of the Rolling Stone articles was a health club called Sports Connection, and they were able to film on location there, so that probably saved them a buck or two. And just like Urban Cowboy and Saturday Night Fever and every other movie in the 1980s, there was a soundtrack. But Perfect Soundtrack featured the hit song Closest Thing to Perfect by Jermaine Jackson. <laughs> it also included uh, Wham Rap by the group Wham, All Systems Go by the Pointer Sisters, Hot Lips by Lou Reed. Polka, polka, polka. Ain't no. Uh. <laughs> what I'm saying is that the soundtrack was not very popular or very good, much like the movie Perfect. The movie comes out and generally everybody disliked it. Vincent Canby with the New York Times said, quote, Perfect is too superficially knowing to be a camp classic, but it's an unintentionally hilarious mixture of muddled moralizing and all too contemporary self-promotion. End quote, that sounds perfect for this podcast. The movie Perfect cost $20 million to make and pulled in 12 million bucks. Woohoo! That is not good. As mentioned earlier, this was a real blow to Travolta's career, but it did pick up when he made three, that's right, three of those Look Who's Talking movies. Remember part two with Roseanne Barr squawking out as a baby girl and then part three with Danny DeVito with Talking Dogs? Yeah, remember those movies happened? <laughs> This wasn't really what got Travolta's career back on track. It was when Quentin Tarantino tapped Travolta to appear in Pulp Fiction. And here things turned around and he really got a second win and made a string of successful movies as a leading man. Now, Jamie Lee Curtis's career didn't really suffer much at all because of Perfect, because two years after the film's release, she appeared in the brilliant comedy A Fish Called Wanda. And then she made a ton more movies and appeared in a bunch of TV shows. And then she won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress just a few years after she was a spokeswoman for yogurt that makes you shit. Speaking of shit, it's time to get Bo in here and talk about this turd of a movie. So slip into your favorite leotard, stretch out your legs so you don't pull a hammy, and let's get physical, physical, with 1985 cinematic homage to aerobic exercise classes. It's perfect. And welcome to Pick 6 Movies. I'm Chad Cooper, and I'm joined by the closest thing to perfection that I've ever known, Mr. Bo Ransdell. Bo, how are you doing today? Oh, geez, Chad. I'm doing good. I'm doing real good. I, uh, I was just getting a little workout in, you know, a little jazzercise. You know how uh, my, my physique is important to me. You doing uh, you doing some of your uh, uh, Slimtastics or some of your uh, aerobonautics? Doing uh, trampersizing. I know you're into aqua squats. Yeah, I like the aqua squats. I'm also into uh, <laughs> some bacon aerobics. That's just uh, lifting a particularly tasty BLT uh, to my mouth. And uh, I was like, hey, that sounds great, but hey, uh, let's hold the tomato there, Frenchie. I don't need to vegetable this thing up. I'm over here curling a couple of 12 ounces. <laughs> I'm basically doing anything i can to try to keep myself awake uh while talking about this movie perfect normally in our seasons you're the one who goes for the deep cut the movie that nobody heard of mm -hmm. and i think i might take home that trophy this season this was one of those ones that was just so unique in what it was taking from pop culture and not only just the aerobics phenomena that was in the 80s which it was huge mm -hmm. but also i think the importance of Rolling Stone as a venue for helping to shape popular culture and how these two things converged 
in this terribly bad movie. Yeah, it was something I hadn't really thought about too much uh, when I was watching the movie, uh, mostly because I you know, was generally <laughs> thinking, hey, if I use toothpicks to keep my eyes propped open, could that cause long-term damage? Well, you texted me multiple times telling me how much you dislike this movie and how boring you thought it was. I hate this movie a lot. I'm, I'm so happy uh, to hear you say that. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was rough watching it the first time. Long time listeners may know, when I go through and take notes on a movie, seldom am I watching it at, say, normal human speed. <laughs> because I've already seen the movie one time. And I'm like, all right, I just need, uh, let me run through this at about like one and a half times its normal speed. And that way I don't have to spend another two hours <laughs> watching people do aerobics. But I got to tell you, man, there is nothing funnier than watching the aerobic scenes in this movie, of which there are two or three extended Mm -hmm. aerobic scenes yes excluding the end credits <laughs> excluding the end credits watching those at double time is very funny that was the most entertaining thing about this movie watching these people thrust and squat and do cowboy moves uh -huh. was sped up you know the only way it could have been better is if you had played the william tell overture or yakety sax they didn't have yakety sax money, Bo. According to your introduction, they spent half a million dollars. Well, that's why they didn't have yakety sax money. They spent <laughs> recreating the offices of Rolling Stone that no one gave a shit about. Scenes that you couldn't possibly care about in the first place, much less somebody. I want to. I want to know who that person was in the audience that was like, "Oh wow, that's good. Mm. That looks. That looks really close." <laughs> You know, how do you know that, Eric? Oh, I know. I know my Rolling Stones decor. <laughs> and that is decorated just like the Rolling Stones offices. Look, the movie isn't boring just because nothing happens, okay? This, yeah, that's part of it, but all right. This movie is really a character study of just flat, dull characters that don't change or have a purpose. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> I suppose you could say there is an arc to John Travolta's character in this movie in that he starts off being an uncaring asshole and by the end of the movie is a somewhat ethical asshole. Well, maybe. But Jamie Lee Curtis doesn't change. I don't know that he has an arc. I think he has a rise and a fall and a rise and a fall and then the movie ends. I think if we kept going, he would have become an asshole. <laughs> right. Something else would have come up. He's also a real pervert in this there's a lot of leers that go on way too long and also this is a movie that couldn't be made today or it shouldn't be made today this movie was sold on two movie stars with mm -hmm. a paper thin premise and i thought about it and the closest thing that came to mind recently was that sandra bullock channing tata movie the lost city Mm -hmm. But that was also like a high concept movie, meaning that the people who made it were kind of high. Hey -oh. But <laughs> <laughs> the, tra the trailer for that film, you got it that this is like, oh, Sandra Bullock is a romance writer and Channing Tatum is this Fabio knockoff. And they get caught up in this romancing the stone adventure and Harry Potter's our bad guy. You're like, OK, I kind of get all of that. It's over the top and it's playful and we're going to have a good time. Although that movie was not terribly good. It should have been better than it was. But the trailer for the the movie perfect is essentially one of those like in a world where people like to have sex one man john travolta and one woman jamie lee curtis are gonna do aerobics and probably have sex this summer one movie only has john travolta and jamie lee curtis where they will do aerobics and probably have sex and that movie is perfect I wish they followed the trope where it just opens on John Travolta and Jamie Lee Curtis having sex. I bet you're wondering how something like this could happen over here. Let's kick off our movie. And this film does something that really bugs the hell out of me, where it starts off unnecessarily at Christmas. And this movie is not set at Christmas, nor was it released at Christmas. And we get the classic Columbia Pictures woman with the torch logo. And we hear the Salvation Army cover of Jingle Bells playing. And the movie opens proper and we get this wide shot of a street corner. And the overlay text reads Jersey City, New Jersey. And in the background, we see the jersey journal building and it's got a like a massive 
Christmas wreath on it. The thing's like two stories tall. And then we get more overlay text that says, Home of the Jersey Journal. The moment I heard Jingle Bell starting in this movie, I, uh, for a second I thought I had written the wrong thing. Yeah. And then I realized I hadn't, and then I was very sad. It turns <laughs> out that John Travolta, inexplicably starting at some earlier point in his career when it doesn't matter. Yes. I don't know why we even have this thing. But anyway, it, it starts with these two old women in this newspaper office complaining about the obituary that showed up in the paper yeah and they're speaking spanish to this yeah. woman who's like you're looking for obituaries down this hall it's the desk with the urn on it You'll see a John Travolta sitting nearby. She points it back to John Travolta, who's on the phone saying like, yeah, I need the cost of death over here for this obituary I'm writing. How am I supposed to even write an obituary if I don't know the cost of death over here? You don't need to know the cause of death. And I know this because whenever I read an obituary, it's almost always because I want to find out how they died. Mm -hmm. Instead, you get these phrases like, went to be with the lord or succumb to a long battle with their illness you roll the dice long illness short illness pick one and go with it give me died in a hail of police officers bullets yeah <laughs> suicide by cop <laughs> left off left off a building screaming fuck you susan while holding on to susan's beloved los Abso snuggles <laughs> disappeared after a ufo sighting presumed dead that's the kind of stuff i want to be reading stopped breathing after turning inside out what died during bathosphere incident i'm like wow this sounds like an interesting life explosive loss of most blood eaten by shark fell up staircase <laughs> i don't know who this is but i'm going to the funeral closed casket open casket i don't care i got questions for the first time in my life i will legitimately be paying respects <laughs> <laughs> so Travolta gets up and goes over to his boss. Uh, he says, hey, boss, you got to get me off the open desk over there. I can't do this anymore over here. And then his boss is like, settle down, John Travolta. Think of this as your last chance to write something nice about anybody. And Travolta says, hmm, perfect. Hey, that's the name of the movie over here. So then we cut to credits. Oh, these credits. You know how I feel about credits. And these were, yeah. these committed numerous sins because <laughs> they splash up the logo for the movie Perfect. And it's written uh -huh. in the same font that's used for Rolling Stone Magazine's logo. Yeah, yeah. And we are forced to listen to this Jermaine Jackson song, Closest Thing to Perfect. And these credits feel like end credits, not opening credits. And it's all, you know, splashing up names against this generic beige background. A bunch of people we don't care about. And this movie is a real blowjob to Rolling Stone magazine. It feels like they're trying to make a movie about Rolling Stone magazine. And nobody gives a shit about that because that would be even more boring than what this movie is. So they just was like, well, we'll make it about a reporter at Rolling Stone magazine. And it'll be about sexy aerobics because everybody's going crazy for the sexy aerobics. You could do... A great movie about somebody writing an article for the magazine, See Above, regarding Almost Famous. Yeah. You know, like, that's a terrific movie about, like, rock and roll journalism and that kind of thing. This is where you and I differ. Like, I don't know how to make this movie less worse. I think it's so fundamentally broken at start. Here's how you fix a movie. So there are two stories that Travolta is writing. There's one mm -hmm. that involves a criminal case. And then there's this puff piece about people fucking at gyms, right? <laughs> yeah, right. You start the movie where everything that's the heavy part of the story has gone down, okay? It's the boss man who comes in and says, hey, look, you got this heavy story. We got to work through the legalities of this while that's going on. I want you to write this puff piece. And Travolta begrudgingly does it. Mm -hmm. And it leads him down a path where he realizes that there is more substantial value in the community that these people find in this type of exercise. It's not just people meeting and fucking. Along that same storyline, you have the background where the issue of him turning over the tapes that we'll talk about in just a few minutes slowly unfolds, and then you bring those two stories together at the end. As opposed to the 15 minutes at the end of this movie where suddenly there's this tape issue? Right. You set that up at the beginning that it's like, that's where the movie kind of starts that story, that he has these tapes, here's what's going on, then the legal part comes in, push comes to shove, and then that's the end. You see that he's actually a genuinely good guy who has principles. 
I'm not saying it makes it good. It makes it less worse. Yes, that would make it less worse. It, it would still be a criminally boring movie. With lots of dry humping the air and sweating. Dude, that's the other thing, is that this movie ought to be a million percent sexier than it is. There's not much sexiness in it at all. It, unless your definition of sexy is just watching women, and let's be honest, men, gyrating their giant crotch bulges and shrink wrap vaginas into the air at one another right it's like some sort of rhythmic group tantric sex set to bad 80s pop songs you never heard of there is talk uh, a lot of talk surprisingly a in sequel? this movie of uh, no oh. of a gangbang hey, it's like give me a little taste of that then <laughs> i don't have to see the whole thing but give me something maybe just some books falling off a shelf in the nearby room anything chad (laughs) other than the absolute nothing that this movie gives you if you're gonna make a movie about journalism you Mm -hmm. have to focus on the drama and tension of the story that the journalists are covering or the associated drama and tension experienced by the journalists covering that story you mentioned almost famous Mm -hmm. spotlight Mm -hmm. nightcrawler Mm mm-hmm frost nixon oh sure yeah yeah there was the long forgotten ron howard film the paper all of these focus on sort of this inherent drama that comes out of the story the movie perfect is just like this sad late night handy to rolling stone (laughs) magazine like there are no stakes in this movie other than are these two people gonna have sex like maybe i don't i don't care we'll talk about it more man but this whole mckenzie scandal that's going on yeah after watching this movie twice i can't totally tell you what the scandal is it's just a scandal he's a businessman and there's drugs and there's business scandals yeah that's it we find you not guilty of business scandal clack clack what just give me anything to hang on to in this movie that isn't, hey, let me just go watch these girls wiggle around over here. I'm glad they're shooting me from nipples up because my hand's in my pants. <laughs> After our opening credits, the movie finally gets started and somehow John Travolta's character went from being the obit writer at the Jersey Journal to being a Rolling Stone reporter who gets articles that are featured on the cover of one of the most iconic magazines of all time what a career travolta in this scene is interviewing a guy named charlie who's the right hand man to the aforementioned mckenzie who's on trial for dealing drugs or guns or something and this guy charlie he says you don't trust the media you you reporters you think you make world go around i don't i don't care you know what he 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 needs to be able to tell his side of the story I gotta go piss. And then the guy gets up to leave. And I gotta go piss is actual dialogue in this movie. Mm -hmm. Travolta watches this guy walk off. And this man enters the lobby of this building wearing um, what can only be described as short shorts. These are Zap Brannigan (laughs) style short shorts Uh and he's wearing this tank top and he's got a ned flanders style mustache again most of my references are drawn from the works of matt graining Uh, i'm a fan Mm -hmm. travolta follows this guy to see where he's going travolta looks out the windows and he sees the guy and two women working out in this gym below are we in an office or maybe a hotel the movie doesn't explain it but then travolta gets an idea ding hey i got an idea over here Maybe I can write a story about people working in the gym over there. Dude, if a light bulb appeared over his head, it would not make any of this film more ridiculous. <laughs> so our movie cuts to the, is he the publisher of Rolling Stone magazine named Mark Roth? And he's looking at photos of the real life Mick Jagger that were taken by a female character named Frankie. My question for you, Bo, is Frankie a proxy for Annie Leibovitz in this movie? I guess so. And here's the other problem. The other problem as if there were only two. Um, th- another problem I have with this movie is there's Frankie and then there's also a woman named Dita who looks a lot like Frankie. Is she the fact checker that he calls? Yeah. Yeah. Who also does, I think, part of the rewrites on his story later. We'll get into that. I thought that was Frankie. I thought she was, or maybe she's not, but they do look alike. I know. It doesn't matter because the movie is is just awful. So Travolta, our publisher, Mark Roth and Frankie, they all go to lunch, even though as they're walking across the street, the sun is setting. Like, details matter, people. Okay? (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. So at lunch, Travolta says to his two co-workers, 
I need to go to Los Angeles over there and try to interview McKinsey for this article that I need back over here. Hey, I also want to do this other story, but thinking about how workout clubs are the single bars of the 80s over here. Oh, great. Is that Carly Simon over there? I wrote an article about her where I said a bunch of bad shit about her. Cut to Carly Simon in this restaurant, and she turns around, and both for a moment, I thought it was Steven Tyler. Yeah, they'll fool you. Have you ever seen them in the same place? No, you haven't. I don't know if I should apologize to Carly Simon or Steven Tyler or both. I like when they did the Aerosmith carly simon mashup uh akin to when they worked with run dmc uh-huh. and it was i bet you think this dream is about you that was both uh, a haunting rock ballad and also a little bit of a mystery because who was who was she talking about i don't know all i'm saying is that if you put carly simon and steven tyler inside the brindle fly machine on the other side a carly simon and a steven tyler walk out <laughs> yeah it's the goddamnest thing bro <laughs> jeff goldler was just like ah that was uh unexpected <laughs> so carly simon she saunters over to john travolta bow in her hand not gonna believe it she has a goblet full of tomato juice bow and you're like, i assume this was a bloody mary <laughs> oh <laughs> But yeah, she just hurls it at his face. It's a real like curse blat. The amount of tomato juice that covers Travolta <laughs> is akin to the amount of marshmallow fluff that drenched Walter Peck at the end of Ghostbusters. I mean, he is <laughs> doused in tomato juice. And you know, they, this, this was one take. There's no way they did more than one. Like, it's all over the walls behind him. So John Travolta is going to L.A. to try to score this interview with McKenzie. While he's there, he's also going to be working on this fluff piece of his. And so he heads to L.A. He goes to the courtroom. Yeah, they, there's a hearing where this guy McKenzie is on trial for business crimes. Right. And he holds up this manila folder with the words, how about that interview? And there's a copy of the Rolling Stone pushed into it, I guess, to identify him as like, hey, I'm a reporter from Rolling Stone. Well, he's flashing it at Charlie, the right hand man, and he's flashing it at McKenzie. But Bo, when we first see McKenzie, did you see Dan Hadia in an uncredited role in this film and think he was going to be McKenzie? Yeah, and it's real disappointing that he is not, in fact. McKenzie, it's this other anonymous dude. It's it, the guy who plays him. His name is Kenneth Welsh. And mm -hmm. he's been in a bunch of stuff. You might recognize him from TV and film. He was in Twin Peaks. I was like, Bo might know him from that. I certainly don't. But Dan Hadia, Nick Tortelli from Cheers, Mr. Wahoo Waturi from Joe vs. the Volcano. Right. He's not elite. He's not in the credits. It's not even on his IMDb. He's just hanging out there. And it's like, wh what are we, what are you wasting him for? He's one of the most compelling actors of that generation. <laughs> When I think about him, one of my top 10 lines is from that first Adams Family movie when they're going to uh, torture Gomez with the hot poker. And he says, mm -hmm. is this going to smell? <laughs> I, what I think of is him crawling on his hands and knees over that uneven farmland as he's about to get whacked in the head yet again with a shovel. <laughs> And Blood Simple. He is so good in that movie. So anyway, either he or his doppelganger really let me down by not being our McKenzie in this movie. So McKenzie leaves the courtroom, gets into a town car, and everybody's like, McKenzie, McKenzie, can, can you, will you give us an interview? And Charlie turns around, he's like, no interviews, beat it. So then we cut to Travolta, and he's typing away on this 1985 word processor. And whenever I see a <laughs> yeah. word processor like this, I always think of the TV show Doogie Howser and his little life lessons that he would type in at the end of each episode. Beep, beep, boop, boop, beep, boop. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Dude, I love, we'll get to this later. I love how <laughs> everyone is so impressed by this piece of shit word processor he's got. Uh huh. If you had a Doogie Howser come in as your doctor, would you put up with that shit? No, of course not. Like if a 14 year old rolled in and was like, hi, I'm a, uh, I'm Dr. Doogie Howser. Excuse me. I'm Dr. Douglas Howser. I'll be your doctor. I'd be like, first off, am I being filmed for a practical joke show? Uh, no, sir. I, I, I graduated high school at four and, uh, and, and went to Harvard at seven. I don't care. Get an adult in here. 
A- absolutely. Yeah. I don't care if you're an incredible genius. I want a grown up to do my surgery. Thank you. You have no life experience. Like, what if you get distracted by the nurse's tits because you're full of hormones right now? And it's not your fault. It's just a no. human imperative when you're 16 years old. Sure. I want someone who is like 45 years old taking a little pill on the side to get it up anymore. Right. Like, that's the guy I want. You know, the guy who's focused on his job, like this is what he does for a living. He's got a family and a mortgage. He can't fuck this surgery up. (laughs) A 16 year old, you got your whole life ahead of you. You can kill as many people as you want on the table. You'll get over it. So Travolta is in his hotel room typing away in his little word processor and the telephone rings, which it does a lot in this movie. There are so many phone calls of people chit chatting from L.A. to New York. Sometimes they hang up on each other just to call each other back. That's something else to fix this movie. You don't set it in L.A. and New York. You just set it in New York. That way you get people interacting with one another, not just yakking into the phone. So it's his boss and Travolta says, hey, Mike Roll, fictitious publisher, Rolling Stone magazine. I'm in Los Angeles over here. I'm working on on these two stories over there. I found the health club in the yellow pages. It's called the Sports Connection. I got to go over here. The next scene's about to start over there. So he goes (laughs) to the Sports Connection. And here... He talks to Nanette. Uh huh. Who we only see in this one scene, but apparently she's the owner of this place. Oh, Bo. She is the actual co founder of the Sports Connection. Her name is Nanette Patafrancini. And you can tell that she is not an actress. Okay. Mm -hmm. Clearly, her thespian skills are barely passable when compared to 1980s era porno. And there's this one (laughs) scene where she gives like all of the perks and the idea for the club. And at the end of it, there's this awkward pause, then a smile. Like she's like, nailed it. Yeah. (laughs) I'm a star. She's showing him around and he's asking fairly leading questions about why the sports connection. What's over there? What's in here? And she's like, yeah, I saw what was happening at bars and I wanted to get people exercising instead of just sitting around eating potato chips so here they can have fun social interactions while still, you know, getting it on. That's a pretty good impression. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I worked on it. And so John Travolta. He teams up with this guy named Bobby to continue the tour. Uh Uh-huh. And all the extras in the background are way too excited to be in a movie, let alone at a workout club. And Bobby's like, oh, over here, we got the racquetball courts over here. We got the uh, smoothie cafe. Uh, They got excellent smoothies. We also have a bar here. They don't sell wine, just beer, because, you know, as Mojo Nixon said, I don't care what your mama's thinking. Everybody knows the beer ain't drinking. Am I right? And I'm right. Put a pen in Mojo Nixon, ladies and gentlemen. We'll revisit him again soon. <laughs> Bobby takes Travolta upstairs. He's like, this is the main room with all the weights and the machines. Um, This here is Saturday Night Live alumni, Lorraine Newman. She's going to be in our movie off and on. Lorraine Newman, John Travolta, John Travolta, Lorraine Newman. What? What is Lorraine Newman doing in this movie? Seeing her name pop up in the credits was like, uh, come again? excuse me a baking powder like i would have been less shocked to see Minnie pearl's name pop up mm. <laughs> <laughs> right like betty ford uh-huh and introducing christy mcnichol what what happened in this movie how did she fall down the hollywood ladder to end up in perfect yeah i'm sure this was a good opportunity for her oh yeah because on paper this sounds pretty good yeah like she doesn't know <laughs> Going into this, how boring a movie she's going to be in. And how terrible, by the way, terribly, her character is treated in this movie. There was one article I read about this. It said Jamie Lee Curtis originally was interested in playing her character over the lead because she's more sympathetic Mm -hmm. and i was like i could see that if this movie was was handled more delicately absolutely i could see that making sense but in this case it's not i would not want to hear the words i'm gonna go see if i can stir up a gangbang come out of the lips of jamie lee curtis i didn't want to hear it out of lorraine newman's mouth i don't want to hear anybody's mouth for that matter yeah and so when he's talking to lorraine newman um he's like so you'd like to work out over here and she's like yeah (laughs) i i'm still in the buff before stage, a before and after. 
I'm not like my friend over there, Mary Lou Henner, who's got big tits, which is her entire personality in this movie, is that she's got big tits. I don't really think of Mary Lou Henner as that being her leading feature. She's an attractive woman, but that... It's certainly all anybody talks about in this movie, Chad. Yeah. Also, Mary Lou Henner, for those who are under the age of, like, 50, Uh whether you'd know her from, what, Taxi? She was an L.A. Story... She's been in a bunch of like smaller. She was on that show Evening Shade. Again, anyone under the age of 50 doesn't know what any of this is. The one thing I think about with Mary Lou Henner is she's got that hyperthymesia condition where she can remember everything. Yeah, that seems like a nightmare. I think they said like 60 people on Earth have been diagnosed with it. I think like maybe 10 of those are here in the U.S. Mm. There was a This American Life or something like that where they talked to people who had this condition. And for those who don't know, it's a condition where you can vividly remember every single moment of your life. Like every day, what clothes you're wearing, how you were feeling. Like it's it's instant recall of everything everything and the nightmare part of it was that they could never forget the pain they felt of the death of a loved one Mm -hmm. the highs and the lows were all mashed up together it sounds awful there's this whole part of your brain that does nothing but change your memory so they're they're easier to deal with not being able to sort of gloss over all the memories of your life and have to remember all the shitty things that happened to you and that you did by the way like being in the movie perfect (laughs) Right. Like she, (laughs) you could go to Mary Lou Henner right now and she would remember how degrading this movie was like it was yesterday. How many times did they tell you no bras on set? Like, were they turning down the thermostat to make sure the nipples were hard? By the way, this movie has a no bra policy for all women. And at first I thought these women are not wearing bras while they're working out. And I thought, well, maybe you don't wear a bra with these type of workout clothes. Like, oh, okay, that makes sense. But then later in the movie, it's just nipples left and right. Air, nipples are everywhere in this movie. Oh, it's so bad. So anyway, John Travolta is like, hey, you mind if I get a couple of phone numbers over here, Sally and Linda? I might need to call you about some interviews over there. Yeah. So he asked this guy, hey, can I get some other phone numbers? Just, you know, random people that I might be <laughs> staring at and want to talk to later. And the guy's like, uh, I don't know. I think that's against club policy. And he's like, hey, how about you bend the rules over here? Because, you know, if I'm going to be cranking it, I need to talk to somebody on the phone when I do it. It's just my thing over here. This other guy comes up. His name's Kenny. And they introduce him to Travolta. And again, Travolta's just ogling all of these people men women and everything in between this guy comes over and he says i'm a really big fan and he goes you are he's like yeah i've subscribed to the magazine he's like oh yeah <laughs> like what else would he be a big fan of random stranger he also says hey i bet you get a lot of lustful matinees starting around here huh yeah and the guy's like are you coming on to me <laughs> he's like what now he's way too close to everyone in this film <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does not respect the bubble at like, all. Later when he's talking to that stripper, I thought he was going to kiss her. I mean, there, it's like he's going to whisper a secret to her. It took me a second to realize, why are you here again? Are we just seeing, like, <laughs> you're just that big a dirt ball that after spending all day staring at people in leotards, you're like, hey, I wonder what they look like if you just took the leotards <laughs> off over here. We cut Chad uh-huh. to the other star of the movie jamie lee curtis doing aerobics in one of the really extended scenes of just her gyrating yeah it goes on way too long but i think that's what people wanted to see like that's what the trailer promised Uh, yeah i guess for all of these perverts and john travolta's that wanted to (laughs) stand around and watch this Yeah, one in the same, if you ask me, but... And the shots mostly feature women, but there are a few very enthusiastic men in this class. And there's one guy that I wrote it twice, and I was like, I swear I think I can see this guy's balls (laughs) popping out of his short. Yeah, there's a fair amount of spiking the camera, too, which I really like. (laughs) Where every now and again, somebody in the background is just like, oh, are they still filming? Oh, shit, they're still filming. I hope they they didn't see that. It's really good. That's the most entertaining 
moments of the movie for me because because after a while, I mean, God bless her. I think Jamie Lee Curtis is a beautiful woman, but after minute four of watching her do aerobics, I'm like, this is creepy. Let me just start watching the background players and see what's going on in the cheap seats of this scene. Well, about that time, that's when it cuts to Travolta and he's like staring at her with these piercing eyes. Yeah. He looks like an Alaskan husky. The guy that he's with, Kenny, is like, yeah, that's Jesse Wilson, a.k.a. Jamie Lee Curtis. We call her the aerobics pied piper. What does that mean? Right. I don't under... She brings people in. She's a... a what are you talking about? And then the before he can explain himself, the guy just bounces and leaves John Travolta to stare at Jamie Lee Curtis a bunch more. Yeah. And this goes on for a long time long time chad Mm -hmm. and not until she's leaving john travolta like chases her down and he's like hey i was watching you for an uncomfortable amount of time while you were in your (laughs) class over here i was wondering if maybe i could do an interview or something no thank you leave me alone i can't hardly believe what i'm hearing in my ears over here (laughs) you mean you don't want to do an interview with the rolling stone reporter how come and she finally says it's because i read magazines goodbye This is the hardest cut of the movie to John Travolta at the strip club alone, sitting by himself. And this is one of the most (laughs) accurate representations of a strip club ever caught on film. It is dank and sad, poorly lit. It's full of lowlifes, including John Travolta. Especially John Travolta. (laughs) And he slips a note to the dancer asking to talk about McKenzie. We see a guy clocking this, who we find out later is Shotzi, her husband. Oh, that's Shotzi? That's Shotzi. I didn't realize that. I heard the spelling later, but I didn't know that was him. I just figured this was her incredibly uncomfortable boyfriend who's looking on filled with rage, covered in sweat and smoking a cigarette. Yeah, Shotzi is the real character that I would like to follow in this movie. Right. But he only pops up a couple of times. One to punch Judge Volta, which makes me happy. But anyway, <laughs> so we, we leave this dive to go to John Travolta catching up with Jamie Lee Curtis outside the sports connection. Hey, I've been thinking about it. I want to make you the focus of my article over here, even though you said you didn't want to be interviewed by me, but I didn't take it seriously on, on account of you being a lady and all and not knowing what's best for you. I don't know if you're paying attention or not, but the answer is no. I got burned once and I'm not going to get burned again. What are you talking about? Like maybe at a hibachi restaurant or something, maybe like one of them cooks like flipped a shrimp at you and it burned your cheek because of something hey i promise we're not gonna go there we're just gonna go to this strip club i know about (laughs) she gets in her car and her battery's dead and she has some jumper cables she says uh do you have a car that you can give my battery a jump and he pulls up his car and john travolta is totally confused as to which is the positive and negative (laughs) cable for this battery loyal listeners Pick six movie safety (laughs) tip. Don't fuck this up. It will blow up the battery or catch it on fire. He just shocks himself. He's like, hold on, let me lick it and make sure it's working. (laughs) Oh, oh, yeah, over here, it's working over there. Hey, do you have a fork or something? Maybe you eating some lunch in your car? I could use that to kind of poke the battery. (laughs) So they start up the car, and I think Jamie Lee Curtis just feels bad for John Travolta. So she agrees to go have an off-the-record lunch with him, which is how I have most of my lunches with people. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much everything I do. I'm like uh, that... (laughs) Danny DeVito paper from L.A. Confidential (laughs) off the record. Hey, if you're a cop, you got to tell me. All right. Oh, yeah. I'm I'm not a cop. (laughs) Wink. (laughs) So we cut to Rolling Stone editor Mark, and he's in a hotel wearing a tuxedo with a woman that at first I thought was a prostitute, but then I realized that this movie's a big sloppy kiss to Rolling Stone. So it's like, well, maybe it's his wife or his girlfriend. And John Travolta calls up and he says, hey, I got a story over here. You want to put it on the cover of the Rolling Stone magazine over there? They chit chat a little bit and it goes nowhere. And the movie cuts to John Travolta and Jamie Lee Curtis, and they're having this off the record lunch you know hush hush on the qt Mm -hmm. and uh jimmy lee curtis says so what's the hook of your story it's not that workout clubs are the nightclubs of the 80s he's like oh no of course not that's ridiculous why would i do that come on johnny come up with something quick (laughs) oh wait i got it you ever read the poet ralph waldo emerson isn't it crazy that his middle name is waldo i'm i'm like where is he over here? It turns out in a book of poetry. You know what else I find interesting is that it's the baby boomers are the ones that are driving this spike in self-preservation over here because the government don't take care of you. 
doctors don't take care of you, so the churches don't take care of you. Hold on, look at this, look at this quote from uh, uh, the great Ralph Waldo Emerson. Hold on, it says here, do that which is a sign to thee thou canst, oh, canst, this was, that's a weird word over there, canst not hope too much over there. Workout clubs are like Emerson institutions. By the way, you're so hot. Dude, that's how he ends this talk of Emerson. Literally says, you are so hot. That's how you seal the deal, Bo. You quote a 19th century transcendental poet, and then you say, you're so hot. That's my move. I don't use Emerson. I use Tennyson, but you know. So Jamie Lee Curtis invites him to take one of her classes. He's like, oh, if only I could, but I got to go have this meeting with McKenzie. He's this guy who is up to business crimes or something. It's a little vague. How about this? We trade, you know, a little even Steven swap over here. You give me an interview and then I'll go to one of your classes or something. And she's like, uh, no. I was just starting to like you, you creep. You didn't think I was creepy when I was staring at you so much? Boy, you got a long runway to creep. I got to tell you. Normally, girls kind of tell me I'm being creepy in the first three, four minutes. But you, like a whole lunch went by. It's probably because I didn't use my signature move where I just rub my fingertips up your arms before I introduce myself. John Travolta then goes to visit the stripper from earlier. And we find out that McKenzie, the questionable drug dealing businessman, he knows this stripper and he was actually the one who paid for the stripper's house. And then the stripper's boyfriend, Shotzi, he shows up and he's like, I don't want my stripper girlfriend's name in any article in the Rolling Stone. Get the hell out of the house that I still can't figure out how my stripper girlfriend paid for. So John Travolta says, all right, I'll leave here. I'll go over there. So he leaves. And then we cut to Jamie Lee Curtis leading an aerobics class as Lou Reed sings a song called Hot Lips. Mm -hmm. And here we meet this guy. I think his name's Jeff. And he looks like Rod Stewart or Leif Erickson or Yahoo Sirius or the Cowardly Lion after he gets his hair done. You are forgetting or at least bearing the lead here. This guy has the biggest package I have seen outside of pornography, maybe ever. I was building up to it. I was setting the <laughs> table, and then I was going to serve the main course. The cod piece, or whatever he has got in his pants, is ridiculous. It looks like, imagine, imagine if you went to the grocery store. And you bought a package of ground beef and just stuck it in the front of your pants. Like, <laughs> yeah, it is huge. And it's not just like normally shaped. It's almost like he's he might need to see a doctor. It reminded me of the bad news sketch about them shoving broccoli down their pants. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because that's how big it is. It looks enormous. And then later when we discover that this guy is dating two women who happen to be sisters as well. Twin sisters. Yeah. It's like, well, of course you are, because one of them's riding the shaft while the other is... Uh, hoisting her up? Yeah, I'm sure that there's some kind of <laughs> scaffold involved in keeping this thing fully erect, because just the sheer weight of it alone. You know, it's like the elephant man, where you you, you can't let him lie down completely because the, the weight of his head will snap his neck, you know? Yeah. It's shocking. So this dude... <laughs> With the enormous package, is also watching. John Travolta is waiting for Jamie Lee Curtis on the other side of this class again, because he's in full stalker mode now. And he says, hey, I just dropped by to see if you needed any batteries charged or something, you know. And then they go to, I think, his place? Yeah, the hotel room where he's staying. Because she is apparently seduced by his battery pun. She says, you know, I went to the library and I pulled some of your old articles. You know, it's not bad. You write a lot about pop culture. And he's like, yeah, you know, culture is the way that society dreams if you want to know like what what's going on in a culture over here then you gotta look at what the pop culture looks like or like the movies and the music and the health clubs you know what are people doing and over what not over here she sees this computer of his this word processor and she's like oh my goodness, look at this advanced piece of technology. Do you leave this on all the time? He's like, yeah, you never know when you're going to have an inspiration in the middle of the night over here. You seem to know a lot about it. How come? <laughs> she says, well, you know, I took some classes on computers. He's like, hey, let me show you how to erase some stuff. This might come into play later in the movie. And I know that back button can be confusing to lady types. So she just types on his word processor, 
wanna fuck where did this come from he has done nothing to earn this other than stalk her jamie lee curtis is slumming it in this movie as an actress and even her character is slumming it in this film <laughs> she has just decided that like she's gonna throw this guy a pity fuck because clearly maybe she's just taking one for the team she's like if i let this guy lose he's gonna go back to the strip clubs he's gonna get all horned up right. and then he's gonna assault somebody <laughs> somebody's gonna get hurt so if i just fuck this idiot yeah then maybe he'll just sleep through the night and then every all of us can sleep a, a little better travolta says hey a good reporter doesn't get involved with this subject over here and then jamie lee curtis says look i'm not your subject travolta leans in and he types in okay over here i give up over there you <laughs> yeah. win over here let's fuck over there and then these two retire to the bedroom of this hotel that looks like it was decorated by your gram gram and their foreplay involves jamie lee curtis giving him way too much direction about warm-ups and blood flow and stretching exercises and proper nutrition and hydration and before they can get to the good stuff the phone rings travolta picks it up and he has one of those wonderful movies movie expository one-sided conversations on a phone that goes way too fast he says hello mr mckenzie how's the trial for drugs and business going that bad huh sure i'd love to hear your side of the story you want to talk tomorrow but i'd have to leave right now and get on the red eye without having sex with jamie lee curtis okay goodbye click over here and jamie lee curtis is like let me guess you need to go hey how'd you know over here he's getting on the red eye uh -huh. okay he's not catching the 310 to yuma Bo. were these two planning like an all-night marathon sex session with multiple rounds you got an hour to kill come on and trust me after he's been staring at these women working out all day it is not gonna take an hour no so anyway he was like hey this is to be continued over here all right i gotta fly to new york city over there so travolta gets on a plane and goes to new york and he calls up publisher publisher of rolling stone mark roth and he says hey i got a meeting with mckenzie over here roth says all right i'll hold the issue of rolling stone for your big story with mckenzie and all of his business drug dealings it turns out the mckenzie in question is actually spuds mckenzie <laughs> who is involved in a horrible bud light scandal yeah so john travolta goes to meet this guy charlie he talked to at the beginning of the movie who just kind of funnels him towards this car where he gets in the back and sure enough there's this guy mckenzie yeah not dan hadia that other actor and you're like who are you uh, old man get the hell out of this car he's like no 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 I i'm mckenzie i want to tell you my full i thought you were loretta you have to get yourself into a flexible frame of mind otherwise you are no place i want those catalogs <laughs> then please order them watch yourself <laughs> <laughs> this is such bad writing mckenzie is in the middle of a trial mm -hmm. and he's like you know i've got a brilliant idea Let, let's go talk to a reporter at rolling stone during the middle of my business crime drug gun trial <laughs> uh, any anybody here say no all right bathroom mckenzie i count two votes yes flush this shit take a shower and we're gonna go talk to john travolta because this movie is just allergic to drama he gets in the car and then that's the end of the scene and then we cut back to the rolling stone offices where he's telling his boss about this and he's like yeah i got the whole story it was incredibly exciting he was telling me all about the crimes and how he got framed and how the government's really giving him the once over yeah i you should have heard it from the horse's mouth but this movie doesn't know what it's doing <laughs> over here we have no idea what the gravity of this situation is it is it treason? Is it drug dealing? And I know this is supposed to be loosely based on the DeLorean stuff, but you got to give me something. Yeah in this movie to understand why do you care so much about mckenzie what are the stakes what are just give me the crime what is the crime he's being charged with the movie does not have to follow real life this is not trying to be a dramatization of real facts that's why as i mentioned earlier if you structured this where the interview with mckenzie took place before the movie starts like he had interviewed him then the trial begins and as the trial goes through they find out oh we're going to publish this article hey we need those tapes because the prosecution thinks that there's some valuable information information on there then those parallels work together yeah right make it have something to do with something in this movie he could be sharing with jamie lee curtis the possibility of him going to jail and what that would mean and what would it mean if they find mckenzie guilty what that means for him it, but they don't it, it's so frustrating and so he gives the photographer frankie becker camera he's like yeah i took a lot of pictures i think you're really gonna like it only like 30 percent in my pants and a lot of them <laughs> from the guy you wanted me to take pictures of so i think it's a win-win for everybody 
somebody over here. He's telling his boss about what the crime is, but all he says is, yeah, it turns out he's moving some computers around Eastern Europe with some dummy corporations, mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. he got busted Ooh. for the crime that I've refused to tell you about. Jeez. Hey, qu- question. Uh, you, you interviewed him for three hours. Do you have the tapes? Oh, yeah. I got the tapes. Don't even worry about it. Wait a second. Tapes of what? <laughs> the, uh, the interview? Oh, yeah. I got tapes of that, too. Give me a day. I just need to put all my notes together and whatnot and use my, my supercomputer that I got that I'd never turned off, and then I'm going to give you an article tomorrow. You're going to be real happy with it over here. John Travolta, he calls up Jamie Lee Curtis at her work, post-workout, covered in sweat, and John Travolta says, Hey, Jamie Lee Curtis, I'm coming back to Los Angeles tomorrow. I'll be over there after I leave New York over here, and I'll land in Los Angeles over there. And so John Travolta, he writes up his article about McKinsey while he's in his apartment. And then the next day, John Travolta gets a call from his publisher and the lawyers, and they say, we need you to come in. So Travolta comes in and the lawyers say, we need a copy of your interview tapes to protect us legally. And John Travolta says, hey, I'm not giving you my tapes over here. All right, I promised McKinsey I'd keep the tapes and they'd stay over here over there. Wow, we think it would be best if you gave it to us. No! over here look i don't care print it don't print it i don't care i'm going back to los angeles i'm going to have sex with jamie lee curtis we had to put a pin in that so i'm keeping all the tapes especially the ones that are sexy the ones about mckenzie too okay goodbye yeah and then he just takes off yeah he goes to the airport to fly back to los angeles Uh uh-huh and jamie lee curtis is there meeting him at the airport and these two immediately just head off to the hotel to have sex he says hey now where were we yeah. And then we see a mystery man off to the side eyeing him. And you're like, oh, what's yeah. this guy up to? Right. If only we ever found out. Well, no, he's the he's the guy with the FBI. But none of that matters. No, anyway, they do some fucking. But again, we don't really see much of it. None of it. Like, I don't need this movie to be pornographic, but just be sexy. And instead, what happens is we cut to a scene of Jimmy Lee Curtis doing her aerobics class and him working out with her. Dude. And it goes on forever because they're are it's way too much aerobics in this aerobics movie even though it's all set in an aerobics club and all that stuff these scenes go on forever and all of their aerobics are just hip gyrations that look like they're air fucking each other it's all this pantomime sex while jermaine jackson and whitney houston sing the incredibly forgettable song shock me and whenever i think about whitney houston both i always Mm -hmm. remember that time on the tv show being bobby brown when bobby brown reminded his then wife whitney Houston about how he had to dig a big duty bubble out of her ass with his finger. <laughs> what? You haven't seen this? Be- no. Is this because of the opiates? Right. So at, at first, when you watch the clip, because nobody, you know, publicly knew that she was such a, a raging drug addict, uh-huh. but she was. I think it was VH1 that aired this. She is shocked that Bobby Brown, he like does the finger motion of how he had to like really just get in her ass and pull out some sort of dried constipation shit rock. <laughs> oh, God. And it's great because at first it's hilarious. Then you feel sad because you know she's a drug addict, but then it's hilarious again because it's Bobby Brown digging what he calls a big duty bubble out of her shit pipe. What a tragic life for such a wonderful person. And I wonder if in that movie they did of her biography, like the, they, the did biopic. Did they have the scene of her getting the duty bubble dug out of her ass? Yeah. They should have. You would have gotten 10 bucks from me just to see that. What if it is? What if that's just sitting out there? We don't know about it yet. <laughs> oh, I want to dance somebody. <laughs> I want to feel the heat. Oh, he's using the whole, he's the whole fist back there, Doc. Bobby Brown's back there asking her, "Do you have any children's books about elephants?" <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any books about elephants. No. Shiller, no books about elephants. Also, question: Why is this movie rated R? There's no nudity in it. Even in the strip club, everybody kept their clothes on. You get just a hint of Jamie Lee Curtis nipple. Wait, when? Later in the movie, after they have sex, and he's on the phone, and and she's kind of walking through his apartment wearing his shirt or his hotel room. Just a glimpse and then i think a couple of f words i think it's r because giving it a pg or a pg 13 rating would have just turned off all those perverts that wanted to see jamie lee curtis and skimpy outfits shaking her ass or they just knew hey this movie is for perverts right let's just make it rated r for language brief nudity and aerobics perverts right 
Plus, some of them are going to be masturbating in the theater. We don't want kids seeing that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Good yeah. point there, Tony. I know your dad had us give you a job for some reason. Also, please pull up your pants, Tony. He calls his boss back in New York and says, Hey, I'm going to need a little more time on this article about aerobics and whatnot over here. Although, I think you should have Christy Brinkley on the cover in a leotard because I've always wanted to see her in a leotard. That's kind of true of every woman I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and while he's on the phone, he and Lorraine Newman are kind of making eyes at each other then he stops a guy he's like hey that girl over there the one who said that she was before and the before and after you didn't hear that conversation but i think you'll know who i'm talking about so name again so they're st- they're talking in the hallway after he asked this guy who she is he says oh that's linda she's dying to get in your article but you don't want to talk to her she's the most used piece of equipment in the gym <laughs> if you know what i mean what a catty little bitch this is <laughs> she's the club's bicycle everyone's taking a ride <laughs> <laughs> we call her thighs Denny's open 24 hours a day. She serves anyone who comes nearby. <laughs> She's a whore. Jamie Lee Curtis says that he did good for a New Yorker and invites him back to her place, which, by the way, is this like stucco mansion that she seems to be sharing with Jeff. His two twin girlfriends, I thought they just suddenly went on vacation in the mountains. Doesn't look like Los Angeles proper at all. Jeff tells Jamie Lee Curtis, hey, your mom's here. And Jamie Lee Curtis says, is she drunk? And then he says she made, what did she make? Oh, divinity fudge. Yeah, she's like, yeah, she's like, she brought the divinity. She's like, oh, geez. So when her mom gets drunk and makes delicious sweet treats, that sounds awesome. My wife pointed out that when the mom comes in, that she's played by an actress named Ronnie Claire Edwards, Mm -hmm. who was Cora Beth on the Waltons TV series. And I told my wife that I never watched the Waltons. And when I did, she took it personally. (laughs) <laughs> why did she why was she so upset she was just shocked like how did you not watch the waltons and i was like when i grew up as a kid i was a little house on the prairie rerun watcher and she was just she was incensed by that i'm in that camp too and i wonder if it's because for younger girls the waltons was more not to say wholesome little house had some batshit crazy storylines there were drunks and werewolves and <laughs> Loch Ness monsters and farmers killing their families at the end of the series they blew up the the whole goddamn town take that john boy ma almost had to cut off her own leg at one point <laughs> yes there was morphine addictions people got crushed by trees while they were logging i'm still thinking about this realization <laughs> that i've had that the, the reason little house on the prairie is clearly superior to the waltons is because it was just nuts i will say i did a like a little bit of kind of that like you know high level web md search you do when you get something on your body you're curious about i did that for the waltons to see if they had some batshit crazy episodes they did have a couple of nutty ones one where they thought they had a poltergeist in their house and one where they got a ouija board and i think they conjured the devil or something but still toe to toe you can't compete with little house when it comes to batshit crazy stuff going on dude i had totally forgotten about the loch ness monster one yeah they made a paper mache loch ness monster yeah And like they bit kids on the legs to get attacked by it. Imagine being in that writer's room, getting high all day, coming up with those ideas. The cocaine (laughs) must have flowed like it was coming out of one of those chocolate fountains or something. (laughs) What movie were we talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This stupid, perfect movie. Anyway, so on the way to this Italian castle that they live in, maybe my favorite part is they're talking about emerson again because uh, clearly this is the foreplay that john travolta uses of hey i'm gonna talk about a little poetry and philosophy over here next thing you know i'm gonna be shooting my load jimmy lee curtis is like well you can't be a completely unobjective observer because of the heisenberg principle so that just by you observing a thing you change the thing that you're writing about and he's like Oh, I didn't read that chapter or nothing. How about we just get naked again? <laughs> yeah, sure enough, uh, her her friends at this Italian castle are like, hey, do you want to come skiing with us? And he's like, oh, I don't know. I might have some work to do or something. The mom rolls out when she gives him this divinity. And Jamie Lee Curtis says, uh, hey, mom, this is John Travolta. He's a reporter. And the mom goes, a reporter? Well, better luck than you had last time when you were a teenager and it fucked your whole life up. I'll be seeing you later. I'm going to go get drunk some more. Goodbye. John Travolta is like, hey, what was she talking talking about over here with the other reporter over there and she's like yeah well i was an olympic swimmer and what i was over here? 
And she says she was really vocal about Jimmy Carter's decision not to go to the Olympics in, when they were hosted. But after the interviews, what the guy wrote about wasn't her political views or anything. She the, she was having an affair with her swimming coach. Allegedly over there. This is where she takes him to the fancy roof so he can call Dita? Yeah, the fact checker. And so while he's on the phone, Jamie Lee Curtis is like, you know what? I changed my mind. You can interview me all you want, but we're going to go skiing with my friends at Mammoth. There's no reason for them to go to a ski lodge in this boat. No, they just do. I mean, it's the very next scene. It's not like, hey, we're going to go skiing together. They're, next scene, we're just there at the ski lodge. Right. And these two are chit-chatting. And Jamie Lee Curtis tells John Travolta, she says, you know, I like to be the best i like to be a winner i like winning trophies john travolta says hey you want to go back inside and break another record <laughs> you know what I'm talking about over there well, here we see the same mystery man from earlier in the airport lurking around keeping an eye on these two yeah then we leave the ski lodge we head back home back home john travolta interviews roger daltrey with the incredible package and also his two twin sister lovers doesn't that invite incest i mean if you are having sex with two twin sisters like if at any point during the act like if their toes touch isn't that kind of incest it's gross right i know th it is a common fantasy or whatever but it's gross it, it's a gross thing you think those winklevoss twins got into some weird shit oh of course haven't they had some creepy adventures or like those property brothers i don't know who the property brothers are yeah you do those weird guys on hgtv the twins they got great big giant heads and huge teeth and they knock down walls i'm going to take your word for it and just say yes they absolutely got up to weird stuff i could see male twins getting into weird shit more than female twins certainly it's the male twins idea more than it is the female twins idea do you think with fraternal twins uh -huh. with a male and female that anybody has a fantasy of like i like i want to have sex with twins but i want it to be a dude and a chick <laughs> yeah of course it's a big world of course somebody's <laughs> got that fetish yeah i mean whatever it is whatever you think of yes that's what it is what about those two fat twins that rode on the scooters on the guinness book of world records yeah that's easy because all your do is combining chubby chasers with twin chasers i could see them going to a whorehouse and just plopping down on a bed and paying like a thousand dollars to get you know this ambidextrous mutual jerk off oh uh, yeah a hundred percent you think they raced they had like a side bet <laughs> what with all that uh get us book of world record money they're just betting on random shit like, like who's who's gonna like pop which, the cord which first one's gonna fit, which one's gonna pop first sure why not if like if i had guinness money of course <laughs> that, that's like why the winklevoss twins are so weird because they've got money to be weird <laughs> when when you have nothing but time on your hands that's where things get fucked up chad i.e elon musk yeah look no further right you know he's <laughs> naming his kids with like the symbol for boron and numbers <laughs> and shit he's dating women that are crazy as he is yeah of course the problem <laughs> with being anything other than ultra rich right is that you've got responsibility You've got shit that <laughs> that has to be taken care of. You got to come home. The dishwasher's got to be emptied. You know, you can't just be throwing money at people to take care of that business for you. Right. Because if you did and all you like all the amenities of life are taken care of, you don't have to worry about food or travel or clothes or heat or any of that stuff. All that you have is whatever your craziest brain comes up with and your money can make it happen. Dark shit happens, man. That's how you end up with like them Jeffrey Epstein islands and stuff. You're right. I know I'm right. I've thought a lot about this. <laughs> <laughs> and what you would do if you had all that money yeah i would have a jeffrey epstein island not with all the human trafficking but it's just like a, a place where german shepherds could be rehabilitated when they were sick or something and the only mode of transportation is water slide now you're starting <laughs> to think like a rich person chad all the water fountains hawaiian punch yeah all my toothpaste is german chocolate cake flavored but it's still healthy it's still good for your teeth because i paid for it so back in our movie, Jamie Lee Curtis and John Travolta, they're driving back from their day trip to the ski lodge. And Jamie Lee Curtis tells John Travolta, you know, I've been thinking a lot about the guy who wrote the article on me and my coach. And I wonder if he knows how many lives he ruined. And I can't trust people anymore on any level. My mom's a drunk and I didn't talk to her for a year because she was the one who spilled the tea all about me having sex with my coach. He lost his job and his wife left him and things were never again the same. It was just humiliating John Travolta. 
Travolta. And Travolta says, but uh, was it true over there? Did you have an affair with your coach over here? Jamie Lee Curtis looks over and sees that Travolta is recording this conversation on his little mini recorder. And Jamie Lee Curtis says, are you recording me? Get out of my car. And both she pulls over like in the desert and just kicks John Travolta's ass out of the car in the middle of nowhere. And she calls him a sphincter muscle Mm -hmm. and drives off. That's right. And John Travolta dies in the desert is what I wish I could tell you. I wish the movie ended right here where it's just like, oh my God, I'm dehydrated over here. I'm starting to have hallucinations over there. But then we wouldn't, get the, we wouldn't get the Boy George convention. Oh my God. So yeah, she <laughs> she stops the car long enough to throw his shit out and then he has to, you know, hoof it back to town. And she goes home to her mom's house and just swims. And her mom says, she must be mad because she always swims when she's mad. The mom's there slugging down wine in the middle of the morning with her drunk old lady friends. Yeah, I like to believe that it's just one white Russian after another, Uh like she's in a Lebowski fest or something. We cut to John Travolta. He's riding in the back of this pickup truck with a bunch of dogs. And then the truck just drops him off at his hotel. That was pretty nice. And here is where we get our Boy George Culture Club conference that's happening. Like all these people think Boy George is staying at this hotel. So they all dress up as Boy George to get a peek at the famed pop star as I'll Tumble For You plays outside. And if you don't know what a Boy George looks like, just imagine any birthday clown you've ever seen and take off all the makeup. (laughs) Right. Also, what does this have to do with anything? Nothing. It's this weird detour that the movie takes where you're like, I don't understand why this is even part of this. I would assume that the people at Rolling Stone were buddies with him and thought it would be funny to throw it in there. I guess. Travolta calls up Rolling Stone publisher Mark Roth, who says, where have you been, Travolta? Everybody is trying to get their hands on the McKenzie story. We're in a whole lot of trouble. And Travolta says, hey, I've been in California for three days over here. I ain't got California. I hate the McKenzie story. I got people chanting Boy George's name outside my window. Look, I'll find an angle for this health club story over here. All right? Because I need Jamie Lee Curtis. She threw me out of the car over there. And then Travolta calls up to talk to Lorraine Newman because he's got to find an angle for his story. Uh huh. He's written in his notes that she's the most used piece of equipment in the gym with some little stick figures of a person bent over and another person behind that person. Mm-hmm. But it's Mary Lou Henner who answers the phone. And I'm like, wait, these two people are roommates? Yup. Why not establish that earlier in the film just by saying, oh, that's my roommate and her boyfriend who also by the way is a chippendale stripper why do that chad when you can just cut to the chippendales after john travolta is like hey do you mind if i interview you over here that's kind of what happens but it happens at a chippendales place and because he is not allowed inside he has to just kind of stand by some lattice and peek in that's where the perverts go you got to stand out there and leer from afar (laughs) that's where the perverts go i (laughs) wish there were a pervert section of all restaurants you know well they have those at chuck e cheese do they it's called outside the building weirdo (laughs) <laughs> so during this Chippendale sequence, they strongly reinforce the no bra rule. And this Chippendale sequence goes on equally as long as all of the aerobic sequences. But there's just a guy doing jumping jacks, wearing nothing but a jock strap with his ass hanging out. And it's it's Mary Lou Henner's boyfriend. That's who it is. It's one of the most unsexy dances I've ever seen a man give. It looks like Party Boy from Jackass on the streets of Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> until we get to Jan Venner dancing at the end of this movie, I thought I had never seen anything less sexy. Mary Lou Henner puts some money between her thighs, and nobody knows that this is her boyfriend, but he bends down between her legs, and she throws her skirt over his head. They all squeal and giggle, and he's slapping women on the ass and bumping them in the butt with his great big old dong. Right, Lorraine Newman is like, nobody knows that they actually go together. And John Travolta is like, hey, but I bet you get hit on by men all the time over here and she says oh you know i do all right but i'm gonna invite you to our birthday party that we're having and so that's what happens we cut immediately because this movie doesn't set something up early and then pay it off later it just sets it up and then immediately pays it off mary lou henner is having a birthday party it's her birthday And there's a bunch of people at their house because they're now roommates, apparently. (laughs) Right. They moved in together between scenes. Mary Lou Henner has to tell somebody, it's not my birthday until midnight, so don't wish me a happy birthday yet. God. 
keep all that. John Travolta is being shown around by Lorraine Newman, and he says, Hey, do you mind if I use a tape recorder? I got thrown out of the car recently for using one over here. And she says, No, you can record anything. I don't want to be misquoted. Also, I was real slut, and I had sex with everybody at the club, and I'm going to get plastic surgery to make my chin bigger, and my cheeks taller, and my ears smaller, and my boobs bigger, because I just want to be perfect, because that's the name of the movie. Perfect. Name of this movie. I'm a little drunk. She gets pissed because Sally is opening presents and her boyfriend gives her an engagement ring. Oh, this is great. Mary Lou Henry's getting married. She gets everything. Big tits. Ring on the finger. Ray Newman gets nothing. Nothing. What's going to happen to me? I'm just going to die alone. I'm going to have to call up Gilda Radner. I hope nothing bad happens to her. <laughs> oh, God. And so she's telling John Travolta about all this plastic surgery uh, that she's going to have. And he's like, let me get this straight. So you're saying the reward for perfection is to be loved. Yes. I'm so drunk. You want to have sex with me? <laughs> um, No, because I'm having sex with Jamie Lee Curtis over there. I mean, ah! right now or nothing. But... <sighs> my life all right you know what i'm just going to go out into the party and i'm going to stir up a gangbang the exact quote is i'm gonna go try to scare up a gangbang which is a weird way to phrase that (laughs) and she walks out into this party and just starts like smacking people on the ass and grabbing their dicks and kind of giving a head nod to the back room and they're like all right boys get out the deli counter ticket machine you know the routine we find out later that it goes down we just don't get a peek at it which again make your movie as unsexy as possible while filling it with sexy people talking about sexy things but nothing sexy ever happens i can't believe i'm gonna say this like magic mike did this much better absolutely magic mike is a million times better than this movie because it like it's actually funny and entertaining and interesting did you ever see the part two or part three of that no but for no other reason than i haven't like i like magic mike well enough i th- I think that is a perfectly fine movie and i would absolutely watch both sequels we did magic mike in the early days remember boy we have plumbed some depths since then magic mike <laughs> is legitimately an entertaining movie with charming people doing funny things none of that's here no 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 so we cut to the rolling stone where christy brinkley is on the cover sure enough and a leotard because hey i asked for it and then it happened i'm manifesting it that's part of scientology over here so his boss calls john travolta from the office to say where's my story about this aerobics place and he's like you're gonna get your story as promised you know airheads and inflated bodies i'm thinking of calling it looking for mr goodbody over here I'm almost yeah. done with it. He says, uh, oh, by the way, turn on your TV. The McKenzie story's everywhere. Did you give that to somebody? Right. It's like all over the AP and whatnot. And who uh, leaked the story? Do they ever establish that? I don't think they ever talk about it again. All right. So the story gets out. That kettle's bubbling. Right. And then there's a knock on the door. Travolta opens the door of his hotel and Jamie Lee Curtis is there. And she comes in and she says, I'm not here for me. I'm here for my friend, the coach. He's back with his wife. Apparently they got back together since we were talking yesterday. And he got a new job. Also, since we were talking yesterday. (laughs) Don't use his name in the article. And Travolta says, the tape of the recording from yesterday over there. You're not going to be in my article. You're not even the focus of it, all right? Also, you called me a sphincter muscle. I hurt my feelings over here. And Jamie Lee Curtis says, yeah, because you are one. And then Frankie, the photographer, just shows up presumably yeah. unannounced. In Los Angeles. Right, to take pictures for the article. Hiya, pal! <laughs> Yeah, and she's looking at Jamie Lee Curtis, and she's like, you look very familiar to me. Jamie Lee Curtis is like, "Uh, I don't know you, and then takes off. Frankie does say before she leaves, is this one of the instructors from the sports erection? That's what you call it, John Travolta, right? Sports erection? (laughs) I'm here to take pictures of all these people working out. Also, Mark had a great idea for the cover. Christy Brinkley and Aaliyah Todd. Travolta's like, hey, that that was my idea from earlier. Had no good so-and-so over there. Dude, before she takes off, Frankie says... 
hey, I'll meet you at the club later. That's going to give me enough time to get an assistant and anything else I need to keep going, which just means cocaine. So we arrive at the club and Frankie starts taking pictures of all this beefcake in the locker room. We get this extended musical montage where she's taking pictures of everybody we've talked about in the movie so far. Um, (laughs) We do get a full frontal shot of Lorraine Newman's leotard shrink wrapped vagina with her legs spread wide open on this thigh machine. Mm hmm. Oh my God. John Travolta is, of course, just ogling Jamie Lee Curtis in one of her classes. And Frankie comes in to take some pictures. He's like, hey, what are you doing? This is just for me over here. <laughs> Send me copies of those pictures. Yes. Life size. Put them on some thick cardboard. I need you to Olin Mills it up. I need one that's like nine by five. I need a couple of wallet size over here. <laughs> Something to take with me on the go. They cut to... John Travolta and Jamie Lee Curtis fucking in his hotel room again. If what is going on in this movie? And then the phone rings, Bo. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a call from the Associated Press. And so while John Travolta is talking to the AP about this McKenzie story, presumably, Jamie Lee Curtis just gets up and starts milling around the hotel room and going through all the drawers and his pockets and whatnot. <laughs> and she finds this advanced copy with the McKenzie article. You know, she flips through that a little bit and then she grabs his notepad and it just says linda gangbang yeah and then she flips a few pages over gaping vagina (laughs) always open oh my god then she turns on the word processor and the movie forces us to read his article Uh like it's the opening of star wars but without the john williams music oh boy that'd make it better (laughs) and you're just reading like she says she's gonna go try to scare up a gangbang over here and they go to a van and everybody takes a turn (laughs) and his article is the most like salacious shocking life destroying thing you could even imagine (laughs) that is his take it's like if the job he had been tasked with was ruin as many lives as you can in a single article yes I go back to how do you make this better? You have him come in and he's a bit of a shit heel, but instead of, as he learns all, not that he just learns all of this bad stuff, have it to where he learns that these people find a place like a second home, a sense of community. It helped them through difficult times. And then he writes a good article because in this, he's just a horrible human being. Yeah. Jamie Lee Curtis, because she went to those classes and also had that conversation with him earlier Uh is able to erase the article, uh, which is what she's doing. And he gets off the phone. He's like, Hey, I just talked to the associated press. I'm going to be a big star over here. Hey, what are you doing with that article? And then she says, I'm deleting your story. What you wrote was hurtful. You're an, a sphincter muscle. What's wrong with wanting to be the best? What's wrong with wanting to be loved? What's wrong with wanting to be perfect? <laughs> and he tries to defend himself to her. Hey, I need an angle for the story over here. It was all true. I didn't make none of it up like I do sometimes. <laughs> and she says, it's all about the tone. You're using people with re- no regard for the repercussions. Yeah, I don't understand what those words mean. What's a repercussion? What's Is that like when you hit somebody a second time, like a concussion, then a repercussion? Tone? What is that? I feel like you tried to say like tone nail. And so she just leaves him, but he chases her out. She basically ditches him, takes off in her car. And on his way back in, this dude Shotzi shows back up and says, I told you not to put my wife's name in the article and sucker punches him a couple of good times. Yeah, while four boy George impersonators look on from a table beside the pool. I'll tumble for you. I know you'll hit me. I knew you'd hit me blind. (laughs) So Travolta goes upstairs with an ice pack on his face. I'm sorry. He decides he's going to rewrite the story so that he doesn't get beat up. And he finishes the story, sends it off to his editor, Mark Roth, and he reads it. And it's all hoity-toity and highfalutin with Emerson quotes and shit like that. And Roth's like, this is terrible. There's no sex or bean sprouts or sex or huge muscles or sex. He says, hey, look at this picture of Jamie Lee Curtis. This is what we really need to, to make this story is all about. Frankie, you there, rewrite the story. And then he says, John Travolta, that arrogant son of a bitch is on his way to morocco what apparently there's a now a third story that he's writing in the mix and i don't understand the first story he wrote hookah bars and belly dancing that's the new singles club for moroccans everywhere here (laughs) also all of the other 
characters, you know, like David Paymer showing up for no reason, what? Frankie, all these people that are just sitting around complaining about this article that he wrote. They're all like, does she look familiar to you, this Jamie Lee Curtis person? Yeah, they got that Mary Lou Henner memory condition. They remember everything. Yeah. Frankie is like, hey, you know what? Hold on a second. Look, let me look at my file cabinet. Hey, look what I got. This is an article about Jamie Lee Curtis being an Olympic swimmer who mouthed off a whole lot, but it turns out the reporter fucked her over and told a story about her having sex with her swim coach, and it ruined his life, and he lost his marriage, and apparently he lost his job, but his wife and he got back together, and he's got a new job. Oh, my God. And Jan, yeah, Jan Venner's like, I love it. Run with it. Put all that in there. I saw in his notepad, it said gangbang. Put that in there somewhere. John Travolta, meanwhile, setting Jamie Lee Curtis up, gives her a call and is like, hey, I want you to trust me over here. When you read the article, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised over there but she doesn't want to take the call like we said you know back in new york frankie is the one who finds this story of jamie lee curtis's coach and when the magazine comes off the press we see that it has in fact been titled looking for mr goodbody instead of looking for mr emerson or whatever highfalutin article john travolta wrote and so we then see lorraine newman rushing to get a copy of this story from a newsstand Uh uh-huh and it starts flipping through and sees her picture and jamie lee curtis's picture Picture. Well, hold on, hold on. The lead picture in the article is of Lorraine Newman with her legs spread eagle and her shrink wrap vagina on full display. Yes. This is a woman who's down for gangbangs. I'm thinking this is like free advertising, right? Right. Like if she wants to be seen as a sex object, which she clearly does. But she's upset. She is. You know why? Because they featured the wrong side of her vagina. (laughs) Right. Not the good side, the good labia. (laughs) They find Jamie Lee Curtis doing aerobics alone. She's just jumping around. (laughs) Lorraine Newman and Mary Lou Henner show up looking all concerned. And then Lorraine Newman hands her the article looking visibly upset. And then Jamie Lee Curtis sits down and reads it as well. Then we cut to Morocco, where John Travolta is at a hookah bar and calls Jamie Lee Curtis from there. And he's all happy and proud of himself because of this highfalutin article he wrote yeah did you read my article over there it's really loud over here yeah and she says you are a sphincter muscle and then just hangs up on him yeah <laughs> judge volta is like hey something don't make sense over here i wrote a good article but now she's upset about it hang on let me call somebody else over here and so he calls new york and asks dita the fact checker he's like hey would you read the article over there to me so i can listen to it over here and the first line is like with her huge lady <laughs> <laughs> lorraine newman offers up a buffet every day at the erection connection boner workout hut he's like wait a minute that's not what i wrote that's not my story over there oh boy i better get a plane back and so he heads back to new york i think he spends more time on planes than he in this movie than he does in this movie (laughs) so at the airport (laughs) he grabs a copy of the article and reads it and he says oh god oh what's that over there i didn't write this over here i didn't write that over there I didn't write none of this. So what does he do, Bo? He drives to Sports Connection. He's told like, oh, everybody's left to go to this Beverly Hills benefit thing. It's a March of Dimes aerobics benefit for kids with birth defects. Forcing them to do aerobics, Chad, is one of the cruelest things that I saw in this movie. (laughs) Your weight has tripled in one year. I'm three. That's no excuse. Next, you're going to tell me that your legs don't work right. Start marching. I can't. It's the March of Dimes. Help. Shut up. John Travolta rushes into this benefit. And everybody wants to kill him. There's that piece of shit who who ratted us all out and made us look like a bunch of dickheads. Get him, boys and girls. Lorraine Newman tells Mary Lou Henner, like, I want to castrate him. Good God. John Travolta ends up finding Jamie Lee Curtis leading a class, and he interrupts this. Hey, forget about this benefit and all these kids and whatnot. I got something to tell you. And she just smacks him and runs off, and he chases her. You are burying the lead here. (laughs) Go on. Because when he runs in to this aerobics room with all these people uh, jumping around, Uh the William Tell Overture is playing. Uh And it continues to play for the next 90 seconds. It is the end of The Lone Ranger. It's insane, I thought this was going to be the end of the movie originally. And then I looked and I was like, there's 20 minutes left. What the fuck? He runs in and it's bum, 
And as he chases Jamie Lee Curtis around this hotel, it is like, and the people in the aerobics room are squatting their legs and like acting like they're riding horses. Including the well-hung guy. He looks like a horse. <laughs> he does look like a this horse. big old floppy cock. This movie's nuts, man. But not a good way. Someone made that choice. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So John Travolta chases Jamie Lee Curtis through the women's locker room and eventually just gets tossed out on his ass. Sure. Dun, 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 and dun, 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 he flies back to New York, drinking his way across the continent and arrives at the Rolling Stone offices with eight o'clock shadow. Uh-huh. Drunk. Drunk. Pissed off. With a baseball bat. Yeah, he just shows up at the... Uh, could you imagine at your place of work, some drunk guy comes in at 9.30 in the morning looking to exact revenge on his boss with a Louisville slugger? Oh, you call man. security. You call the cops, man. Uh, depends on how you feel about your boss. It may be like, let's see how this plays out. My phone doesn't work, guys. Mine either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He just busts into Mark Roth's office, slams the door, and just goes full shining and starts beating the shit out of this place. We, but again, the movie closes the door and you don't see it. Nah, you just hear a bunch of crashing <laughs> and like cat screeching. <laughs> right. Again, why bury the most interesting thing going on in the scene behind the door so he smashes up the office and you hear john travolta scream out you rewrote my story you piece of shit get over here over there finally john travolta he exits the office and we find out that that guy who had been spying on him as mentioned earlier is an fbi agent and he comes over to john travolta and he says we have a subpoena for you and your mckenzie take so john travolta he's in a pickle this movie's going to end in about two minutes strangely yes a whole subplot's being introduced right now but the movie's almost over there is a new subplot entered in the last like literal five minutes of the film so john travolta gets back on a plane goes to california to be part of this trial while he's on trial jamie lee curtis is watching this on tv at first we just see her jumping rope <laughs> And then there's a newspaper nearby that says, like, McKenzie trial starts today. John Travolta is marched through the court hallway, hounded by reporters. This is where we see the TV story, where it's the reporter, rather than introducing this as an actual plot point, the reporter is just like, hey, by the way, John Travolta could be jailed for contempt if he doesn't turn over these tapes. So everybody got that? Great. So then we cut to John Travolta on the stand and prosecuting attorney says, will you turn over the tapes? And John Travolta says, I will not turn over the interview tapes over here or over there. I'm an honorable reporter who keeps my word. I did not write that story about the sports erection, by the way. Sports connection. Sorry, Ron. My girlfriend's here over there. See, that's Jamie Lee Curtis. She somehow got in so that she could hear me testify. And then let, let me show I'm a really good guy over here. And the judge is like, well... All right. How about this? If we were to let you go until three yeah, o'clock today. That sounds good, everybody. I'm out of here over there. Would you bring us the tapes then? Am I gonna, no, I'm not going to bring the tapes back over here. Oh. I'll never do that. All right. Well, then you can go to jail. Oh, wait, what? Oh. <laughs> And that's what they do. They slap handcuffs on him mm -hmm. and they are going to take him to jail. As Jamie Lee Curtis leaves the courtroom, Rolling Stone publisher Marth Groth comes over and he's like, hey, are, are you uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, the, the Pied Piper of aerobics? And she's like, yeah. He's like, I need to tell you something. And they leave it to us to figure out that he confessed to her that Travolta didn't write this story. I guess that's what is being said there again it would be nice to have that scene eventually smooth jazz plays as he's taken to jail it's some sexy saxophone <laughs> yeah jimmy lee curtis shows up at the jail too and is calling to him through the fence as he's led inside jamie lee curtis i'm a good guy i'm going to prison i'll be over here you stay over there and then we go back to court where the jury has found mckenzie not guilty of business crimes clack clack all right, John Travolta can get out of jail. What? He's put into jail, and then like literally 15 seconds later in the movie, he gets out of jail. That's right. So he gets out of jail. Jamie Lee Curtis is there waiting for him with a sea of reporters and news photographers. We get that same sexy 80s saxophone music. And then John Travolta and Jamie Lee Curtis, they climb into her beat up car. They make out for about 10, 15 seconds while people snap pictures, and then they drive off into the sunset. End of movie. And then we get a treat. Oh, dude, Chad. 
so what happens is it's like let's meet the players and we get a shot of the actors along with their characters names and their names with them doing aerobics correct they all acquit themselves reasonably well with the exception of rolling stone editor jan venner who has the dopiest smile on his face and also the a complete inability to capture any kind of rhythm with his body and he's also wearing a gratuitous rolling stone t-shirt yeah and kind of short guys always on brand yeah lorraine newman looks really uncomfortable doing aerobics she kind of jokes it up yeah you know by doing like the chest press and referencing her boobs or lack thereof yeah and then travolta doesn't dance at all he doesn't do any aerobics he just kind of smiles and looks around but he has kind of a natural rhythm like i don't care for the movie grease at all but when he's kind of dancing his way through that movie it's at least like oh i get it danced in saturday night fever and its sequel staying alive yeah so he's danced in other movies i've never seen either of those Ooh. Let's (laughs) Let's <laughs> just put a lid on it for now. That's it. That's the movie. That's the movie perfect. It's awful. What a terrible, terrible movie. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Like, this is the worst movie we'll cover <laughs> this season. In a, in a season filled with terrible movies. The reason this one also might be my bottom is because it's almost two hours. Because of all of the montages and whatever. But if, if your kink is that you like watching people dance around in leotards, this might be the movie for you but otherwise stay away from it. yeah it's just a boring movie it's two hours long nothing really happens everything interesting in the movie takes place off camera it's just terrible yeah it's pretty bad Bo. yes can you give us something that may be redemptive for episode four of this season's theme pop culture club yeah let's talk about an honest to goodness vibrant colorful video game adaptation oh what do you have in store for us um there is nothing more iconic in video games i would argue than a scrappy little plumber with a bushy mustache (gasps) and his brother the two of them plumbing their way into our hearts and no i'm not talking about the super mario brothers movie which is racking up like half a billion dollars in its first weekend i'm talking about the other super mario brothers movie the one with british actor bob hoskins and john leguizamo and the sadly deceased dennis hopper and fisher stevens a movie that begs the question huh it is shorter it is filled with more nonsense I'm really excited to talk about this movie because it's a terrible movie, but it's terrible in all the ways that make terrible movies interesting. I got to say, for people of a certain generation, talking about you and me, Uh the pop culture impact of Super Mario Brothers, especially with the original NES system, that was one of the biggest things of my life of just how huge that game was. And when this movie was announced and when it came out, fans everywhere were just like beside themselves with anticipation. And it just came out and it was just a big shit on your head. (laughs) It was so bad. Yeah. It gets everything about Super Mario Brothers wrong. It's like somebody directed the movie after having had Super Mario Brothers explained to them by somebody who had once heard about the game. But Chad, I think you will be interested to learn that there is a twisting and winding road to the big screen. And much of that is why (laughs) Super Mario Brothers is the movie that it is. Well, I will look forward to being back in two weeks' time to hear all about that. And we invite all of you to return in two weeks' time to join us as well. Uh, You can always reach out to us at pick6movies at gmail.com. You can find us here and there on social media. Leave a review, uh, like, rate, do whatever you do or not. We don't really care. Uh, Bo, any final thoughts that you have on the movie Perfect? Hey, I think maybe we can get Mario and Luigi and some leotards over here. Oh, look at that Princess Peach. I'm just going to stand here and watch this. Ew. We'll see you in two weeks' time, everybody.